Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening to have an incredible treat because not only do we have Michael Attenborough making his CFT debut as the director who is here, but we also have the author, Frank McGuinness. Um, yes, thank you, you see. Amazing. <laughs> who they thought you might have been, if not Frank McGuinness. My evil twin. Your brother. evil twin. That's a terrible. Um, he gets me into terrible trouble. Terrible trouble. Well, you know, you, you can blame everything on him. Um, I expect many of you have been to all of the shows in the Minerva over uh, this wonderful season. Um, the show that is opening tomorrow night, Someone Who'll Watch Over Me, um, is the last of this season, and it is one of the most extraordinary uh, productions I think I've seen for some time, not just here. Um, and what we're going to do, as usual, is talk um, as if we were having a private conversation that you are watching, and then we'll take about 10 minutes of questions at the end. Um, I'm gonna do an introduction to both uh, Michael and Frank, just in case any of you haven't yet read your programs, and then we'll uh, get going. You know that one of the things that CFT has been trying to do this year is have a range of plays that look at and think about not just war, but the consequences of war, the consequences of conflict and crisis. And this is the second of those following on from uh, the Somerset Maugham that I know many of you saw for services rendered. Uh, so on my far right um, is Michael Attenborough, and he is one of the great uh, directors of our time. Um, he has worked in many places. I, I started to write them all down. Colchester, Leeds, the RSC, uh, Young Vic, Hampstead, you know, and then thought, this is silly now. Um, but many of you, of course, will have known him as running the Almeida Theatre from 2002 to 2013 and making that theatre the best off-Broadway theatre, as it were, uh, that the country has got. Um, and we are delighted that Michael is here for his CFT debut. Um, sitting in the middle, the evil twin of Frank McGuinness. What would you like to be called as the evil twin? I think evil will do. Evil. <laughs> Mr. Evil, in the middle, very appropriately, um, is the award-winning playwright, uh, Frank McGuinness. Um, Twelve uh, amazing plays um, that you will have heard of, but you also will, I suspect, know someone who will watch over me, uh, which first came out in 1992 and has been um, reproduced since then, but we're, this is very special to have it here. The first of Frank's plays was Factory Girls in 1982, um, and one of the most wonderful plays, which I think is being revived at the Abbey uh, next year. Yeah, I'm touring the UK. Yeah. Yes, and it's uh, Observe the Sons of Ulster Marching Towards the Somme, which uh, first came out in 1985 and is a most searing um, play about the, the, the men, the men that went. And as we sit here to do it, in Sussex we have a similar link with that, in that in the First World War, on the eve of the Somme, the Battle of the Boar's Head, all the Sussex regiments were wiped out in the space of a couple of um, hours. And it's known here as the day Sussex died. So it has a particular resonance, your play, for different reasons here. So the play, Someone Who'll Watch Over Me, Frank, is inspired, but not about, the hostage crisis and the hostages that many of us uh, first heard of on the news, Terry Waite, Brian Keenan, John McCarthy. So how did you start to think that this was a play you wanted to write? Was it a friendship? Was it an idea? Where did the first idea come from? Well, so many of my plays had their origins in my, um, in my late mother's strange imagination. <laughs> and. Um, she came from a particular generation of Irish people who had a very um, profound and very practical faith, mm. Catholicism, or Catholicism. And it took um, an extremely simple um, style of belief. She would um, pray on her knees, without being a, she wasn't a fanatic, but she would pray on her knees for maybe a half an hour every night um, while TV was going on the rest of it. And she always prayed, prayed for Brian, always and ever. Mm. And she prayed for him because she wanted him to get safe. But she also particularly prayed for him because she believed he looked like me. <laughs> Brian does not remotely <laughs> look like me. But my mother, have a beard. <laughs> my mother thought, a red beard, mine yeah, used to be red yeah. as yeah. well. <laughs> and my mother thought he did look like me. And she kept dropping um, not very subtle hints. Mm. Not that I should pray for him, because she knew that was a no-no, <laughs> but that maybe I should try to do something to publicise, some way of publicising what this poor fella was going through. 
The fact that when I finished my degree, the first job I was offered was in Libya. Oh, it was yeah. in the 70s when there was nothing happening in Ireland. Um, and the fact that she was the one who said that if I went to Libya, I wouldn't be killed there. I'd be killed getting on the plane because she would do it. <laughs> that, that kind of connected this even Martha more. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so she had this, as you like, um, very strong desire hmm. that I would do something about Brian and, and, and John and the rest of it. And, I mean, in her indirect way, she was leading me to this subject. Yeah. Um, at the time, I was questioning um, you know, my, my whole uh, playwriting ability and what was I doing with things and what was I at. And I was at a stage of my career where I was like 10 years after the Factory Girls and I decided to go into a rehearsal space and have a play there that had absolutely nothing to say about itself other than its language mm -hmm. and that its politics would be um, broad in their uh, national appeal, England, America, Ireland, and subtle in its um, sexual um, confrontations between three men. Mm -hmm. um, and the story all started to click uh, and the final part of the, the, of the whole setup was um, hearing wonderful Ella Fitzgerald out of the blue singing Someone to Watch Over Me mm. and thinking there is a great title, there's a fabulous title. And I was reading as part of the research the Koran and I discovered this chapter in the Koran where uh, repeatedly they say, remember you that over there there are watchers. And I thought, well, that's now, I'm, I'm off, I'm yeah, flying. Yeah. And I sat down and I did the first draft of the play and it came with remarkable speed, not, not, not yeah. too easily, but with remarkable speed. And then I rewrote and added, for the first time really ever, I was adding things wrong and taking them out. And it went from there, actually. Um, that was it. Uh, you know, we had the various ups and downs of trying to get a production. <clears throat> I met Brian. Was Brian out by this stage? Brian was out by this stage. And did you say to him, can I come and meet you? No. No. No, what I said to him was, I'm, I was working in Galway. Yeah. I was directing the play in Galway. I got some time off. And um, Brian was living in Mayo when he was a close friend of friends of mine. Right. And uh, we managed to get word to him that the play was going to be read on a Sunday night uh, in uh, the theatre that I was working on. Uh, and... Uh, I know that my friend had told him, look, it's suggested by your situation. It's not about you. It's not about you. And he came to see it. And he was... Were you nervous? Support. I was crapping myself. I was uh, me in there. That's a technical term, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen. In theatre, we use this. <laughs> but um, anyway, he, he's a lovely... He's a very... Sh God, he's a shy, a yeah. private man. But he was extremely supportive. And we met and we talked. And the only thing he asked for, didn't ask for any change of play, just asked that it not be performed until John was released, John McCarthy. And at that stage, I don't think it's any big secret to know that Brian was convinced John would die. Yeah. Absolutely convinced about it. And I give him my word of honour that it would not happen until we knew that John was going to get out. And I told him the last thing I said was, he will be, he will be, there, he will be freed. Mm. And from the day that he was freed, the play went out. Yeah. to see could we get it done and it was taken with enormous rapidity uh, I had worked with dear Michael at Hampstead so I had this big bond with Hampstead uh, but Michael had left Hampstead at that stage and Jenny Topper was there and Jenny came back very quickly and said we're going to do it yeah. we're going to do it and we got the cast we were looking for and we got the designer and, and everything went and was well. your ma around to see that you had done something she, she knew that it happened yeah but she wouldn't come to um She'd never been, she never went to London in her life, actually. She wasn't that kind of a... Well, she's very of, wise. She was very she, wise. She, well, she went to Lourdes, and my brother <laughs> used to take great delight. <laughs> she's got food poisoning at Lourdes. <laughs> and my evil, my real evil brother, Jane, <laughs> said, you know, she was the only Irish woman ever who went to Lourdes and came back in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> She loved him for that. <laughs> so I think, I think London would have been way beyond the beyond. Way beyond, yes. Even Hampstead, even Hampstead. <laughs> um, Michael, the, one of the things that Frank was just saying about, you know, this, this idea of being absolutely about men and the emotions and the language and the politics gives the director 
a heck of a challenge because in the end it is three people confined in a cell there can't be scene changes really there can't be new people coming on there's not different lighting so you've worked together and you know each other but when you started to approach this did you have an idea of what you wanted as the design how you were going to do it or you know what was your first entry point into working with frank on this production um well i should say that what sounds like a limitation for a director uh with the, the, the if you like the format of this play is my idea of heaven that that for me putting three people in a space and saying we're going to see these three people interrelate for the ex- for the next following number of hours or whatever is my idea of, of bliss i i'm i will engage with you know va- the vast mechanics of theatre when i need to um i've done eight shakespeare's so you, you have to but uh you know it, it, it the idea of just three people in a space three people who two of them we meet them when they've spent two months together and then we see the third person arrive and we see them form their relationships from nothing uh is so riveting to me and there's a kind of melting pot uh element to this play which again is heaven to me which is that there's no choice uh they they are um, I have to tell you, it's one of the... Uh, I digress. But um, it's one of the major challenges of doing this play in this space because anybody who has worked in thrust stages like this will tell you that the secret to enabling the audience at phys- visual access to the place to keep people moving, that's not possible in a play when they're, where, tra- when they're three <laughs> chained to the floor. Yeah. Um, so that's been quite challenging. But, of course, the plus is that you're right in the room with them. Uh, and you see them sculpturally, and we've sort of lit, lit it sculpturally. But that th- that element of being forced to, to relate, you you can't go anywhere. Uh, and quite early on, one of the characters says, you know, we either civilize to each other, we either look after each other, or we're going to be we're we're, we're going to go mad. So there's a choice here. We're in this together, and. Because the play um, is about three people from very different countries, equally divided by a common language, um, w- one of the fascinating elements in the play is indeed the way in which people identify their, their own sense of who they are and their own sense of how they relate to other people through language, through their use of language. Um, through even the music of language. You've got three different accents in this play. So, and I'm, I've become, as the older I've got, the more absolutely fascinated I am by language. Absolutely fascinated. And since I've become a complete Shakespeareophile, I've become even more fascinated about it. And this takes uh, an Englishman, an Irishman, an American, but the Englishman, I haven't actually told Frank this yet, but, um, uh, <laughs> but the, 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 the Englishman... Um, is uh, an expert at Old and Middle English. And without giving the play away, he at one point says, I love my country because I love its literature. And his understanding of his country comes through his sense of the, of the history, of the, of the development of the language. And I, I have to tell you, I'm n- no way a, an expert on Old English, but I, in my research for this play, I realise it's a completely different language. Yes. It's much more like German than it is than it is English. I don't know whether I told Frank this, but my grandfather, my father's father, um, was a specialist in Old English, and um, and also bizarrely, my grandmother, you will understand the significance of this, died in a car accident prematurely. Extraordinary, which. I shan't spoil the play for you, but you've just given something away. But um, uh, uh, and within 24 hours of receiving in the post the f- paperback reissue of the one book that my grandfather wrote about the Anglo-Saxon period, we started rehearsals for this play. It was quite uncanny, and there it is, and it's called "The Laws of the Anglo-Saxon Kings," um, translated by F. L. Attenborough. 
And um, I was very moved by that. I, you know, there was this man, self-taught man, who went to Cambridge and, and was absolutely riveted by those old, those old poems. But how do three people thrown together who can't, can't literally can't touch each other, uh, how do they relate? They relate by what they say. It's, the relationships are entirely based on language. How you say language, how you use language, and of course, as crucially, how you hear language. And I find this fascinating. I'm making it sound like it's a linguistic exercise. It couldn't be anything less. I mean, actually, it's a very, very emotional play, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, but that's the vehicle through which the relationships are conducted. Um, and they have no choice. Yeah. And um, watching it, I, I certainly felt that that was what was incredibly powerful. One was the sense of maleness. What does it mean to be a man and how do men relate to other men? And secondly, the idea that the only thing that can save you is stories yeah. in that situation. And so the way that the language to start with is brittle and combative in some ways. It's their weapons too. And then there's a falling away. And it is always that threat underneath it all. The one thing is not just that you might be taken off and executed, but that you will go mad. And the sense that going mad actually might be worse. Well, it's, the circumstances, of course, are that everything is taken away from you. Everything. I have a theory that the most potent four-letter word in the English language is the word home. E.T. phone home. You know, we all know what home means. That's why one of the most miserable words in the English language is homeless. And they've lost their home. They've lost everything. And so all they have as they sit in this cell is who they are and, who, and, and their sense of themselves, their sense of identity is entirely related to nationality and to the sound of, the, of their voices and their history. So the, as they battle to hold on to themselves and their sanity, as you just put it, their sense of nationality is ter- becomes increasingly important. Um, and it's fascinating watching across the play how nationality starts as a weapon and, and slowly, uh, 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 as the play progresses, turns into a, a, an embrace, in a way, that, that they, 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 they reach across the sea to each other. In this case, they reach across the cell and, and they look after each other. And indeed, there are, as you will see in the play, the resonance of Frank's title is that actually the people who watch over them are each other. But what's, I mean, the the issue of nationality is significant in a different sort of way, as you were saying, Frank, when you were talking about um, Brian not believing that John would ever be released in, in the real world as opposed to the imagined, inspired characters, because an Irishman was neutral. A Brit was not. And you chose to make the third an American rather than another Brit. So was that a sense of the axis of nationality within that part of the world? Did it seem important to have the third as an American, given how significant Americanism is within that? Is that why you did that rather than have... No, it wasn't really, actually. To go back to Michael's point about language, I wanted to work with what I regarded as the three great dialects of English, all the people... Scots would choose another, Australians would choose another. Um, but I wanted Irish, American, and uh, English, English, the three different yeah. So the music languages. of the languages. So that those three would be yeah. there and heard. I also was, at that time, and maybe still is, um, a, a, a very um, racist anti Americanism uh, about in there. And almost as if when an American. Um, you know, a citizen was shot that they, they deserved it. Yeah, it was their fault. It's and I, I found that such a revoltingly racist yeah. attitude. Um, so I wanted to um, create a character, Adam, who would be um, a confused being and a difficult being, and in many ways a contradictory being, but also an admirable man. Um, and I also wanted him to be um, of sufficient beauty in every respect that the Irishman could... Um, not fall for him in, in, in a, an erotic way or a romantic way, although, who knows, I never despise the erotic or the romantic. Um, but certainly that you could understand why he would become close to him. Yes. Um, and 
it would be a lot easier for an Irish person to get close, an Irish man to get close to an American man. So that's really why Adam is there in the shape that he's in and with the nationality that he is. It was an acknowledgement that um, everybody held in the terrible position that these men were held had a right to be released. That was their dominant human right to be released. That they were themselves not a representative of a government. No, they were not. Of course, they were, they were, the, they were true human beings with true human relations and, and you watch them build up those friendships and those intimacies between each other which I hope is the uh, embodiment and the dramatisation of what they're like when they're outside as well um, you know I think that that was um, something that I, I, I truly wanted to get across and, and you mentioned earlier this persistent almost paralysing terror of being shot of living under sentence of death um, and I think that to some extent, uh, the Irish and the English captives were living under that. But the American captives were living much more closer to the age, uh, much more close to the age, rather, and much more um, a need of confronting their own end. Mm. Um, and Adam, in his way, does it through uh, calming the other two. Mm. Um, but in fact, what he's doing in his professional way is calming himself as much as possible. And then when that the near of control collapses. You see the frightened human being that's there. Um, you know, he, he's well aware that his status as American makes him, if you like, in a terrible way, powerful. But he's powerful now only in so far as the first to go will be him if anyone is to go. And I wanted to um, pay respect to, um, to, the, to, those, the, to those hostages who were American and who did die. I want to pay respect to them, actually, as Brian would have wanted as well. Because I think his, you know, I'd written the play before I'd met him. I'd written the play before I saw his fear for John. But when I saw his fear for John, it really dawned on me that this man knows how visceral the terror of death is for those held in this situation and how urgent it is and how necessary it is that you keep your energy up, that you keep not to your denial up, but that you keep your intelligence working so that you have to um, refuse to bow down to the blackmail is not the right word, but refuse to bow down to the terror. You will not do that. And that you will not, you will keep yourself, regardless of having no power over yourself. Exactly. Um, one of the um, things that I, I was thinking when I was watching, uh, well, after I was watching, was that the rapport between the three actors is, is amazing. And so there were two questions I had. One, did you encourage uh, the actors, uh, you know, to go and read some of the real, you know, Brian's written about his experience, Terry has, John has, and other people have as well. Or did you leave that up to them? And secondly, after that, Michael, to you, the, did you group audition them? Because I, I know often in plays, of course, you, you have the lead, and then you put people around the lead. But this is so much a piece that is about those three and the shifting power. And I wondered if it was... You know, even though they're really experienced, big grown-up actors, yeah. you did actually need to see them with each other to see if they could see the beauty in each other, as Frank said. To answer the first question, um, I was thinking about that when <clears throat> talking. We talked a lot about um, Keenan and Waite and, and and McCarthy, and I think there's a kind of waiting terror for actors when they play people that bear a strong resemblance to real people. As, or, or, or are like I did a play about heroin addiction and I knew that the cast were really frightened about being authentic and, and in a sense representing the addicts I mean truthfully and properly and I think you have to be very personal, it's my own personal opinion you have to be very careful about how you encourage actors to research so I have a very simple policy, which is I do as much as possible. I send messages to the actor saying, do as little as possible. And I will arrive on day one, and I will guide you to what I think you need to look at. Because otherwise, you can, over, you can fill yourself with a lot of pointless research, but worse, you can actually develop a thing, I can't possibly live up to all this research. It's not possible. 
So I read evil, An Evil Cradling, I read John McCarthy's book, I read Terry Waits' book, and they have differing uses in lots of ways. I think probably Brian's is the most helpful. But m- the point being that is that Frank didn't write a documentary. Not only did he not write a documentary, he wrote a play about three very different people, and particularly two very different people, to Brian and to John. I mean, and he's deliberately, you might even say almost mischievously, um, uh, <laughs> reversed their um, professions. That, um, yes. <laughs> uh, that, that Keenan is the, is, is the character, the Irish character is a, is a journalist, and, and the English character is the academic. But um, I, I was emphasising to them again and again that they could, uh, it would only to do, be to do with the physical circumstances of being in prison that was, that was of helpful. But in terms of finding a character, forget it. And I'm a great believer, and I do this rigorously with most plays I do now, but particularly with Shakespeare, or, and as careful and as meticulous a linguist as Frank, I say, don't go into a corner and invent a character forensically examine the text because everything that you need to know will be there because everything that the audience needs to know will be there because Frank will have put it there. And if he didn't put it there, it isn't necessary for the audience to know. And you could argue even that it isn't essential for the actors to know. So the research was very, very guided and meticulous. What was your second question? (laughs) Um, uh, Well, whether you um, made a decision to... Audition oh, groups the audition of men. Process. Well, the audition process of this play was very eccentric. Um, See, I in, just thought it might be. I yes. don't know. <laughs> um, uh, not, not intentionally so. But um, it was, I was originally brought this play by a commercial producer who wanted to produce it in, in the West End. And commercial producers have one basic criteria. They want huge box office names. And they don't grow on trees. And uh, with great respect to Frank's magnificent play, the fact, the fact is it's been done several times. So the idea of coming back and doing Frank's play wouldn't necessarily be a career-defining moment for a David Tennant or somebody of that box office ilk. So we, when we weren't getting the box office names that the that management wanted, frankly, I didn't care about. I mean, if you got a box office name, it would be brilliant. That was fine by me. But uh, that's not my concern is what happens in a rehearsal room, not what happens in the box office. And so when we came to, to Chichester, I was suddenly liberated to cast the best actors, irrespective of their box office pull. Um, and by that time, actually, um, David Haig had said yes to Michael, uh, which is great. Um, and he's a very well-known actor. He is. Audiences. Uh, uh, he, he, if, we'd, if we'd found names for the other two parts, it would have gone in the West End. And um, I decided that Edward the Irishman was the next person I should, uh, I should cast. And again, this was the freedom I was granted because a lot of the names we were talking about pre-Chichester weren't Irish because the number of huge Irish names are not many. And Liam Neeson's not right for the part. Um, uh, so, you know, it, 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 it was a... Uh, it, 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 so the field suddenly opened up that I could actually see some top, top Irish actors. And I saw several. And I, I'm a, I have to tell you, I'm a terrible... I mean, the idea, if you ever asked me to act on a stage, I'd run a mile. But I am actually a frustrated actor. So auditions are great fun to me because it's my Did one Did you chance. read? I can read oh. in, you see. But I knew, even though the character was, um, is, is called Michael, um, I, I was struggling um, uh, uh, to, to give my poor Irish actors um, somebody to bounce off. And so I asked David if he'd come in and read with the Irish actors that I was shortlisting. Uh, just to give them a fair chance. It wasn't about chemistry. Um, it was just about, finally, that's my job. And I, and I just sort of feel, even if, uh, you know, David had been in the Antarctic, I still would have had to cast this part. The reason I say it was eccentric is that um, in casting Adam, the, the American, um, I virtually decided to cast someone whom I'd seen amongst a lot of actors that I'd seen. And then my ca- brilliant casting director said, there's one other person you must see. I said, oh, great, sure I will. Well, there's a slight problem. He's in Budapest, right? So how are we going to do this? Well, he's going to put on video an audition for you. I said, you mean I'm not going to meet him? 
I want to work with him. I'm going to see if he takes direction, that sort of thing. Difficult in Budapest. So anyway, Adam did put it down, and it was absolutely astonishing. And it really was a lesson to me that actually I smelt talent. I just smelt talent. And I knew he felt in his bones who this person was. And um, so then we had a Skyped conversation uh, where basically you discover whether you share the same sense of humor. I think if you share the same sense of humor, you can work with someone. Uh, we discovered very quickly we did. And the rest is history. But that's the first time I've ever cast anybody um, from Skype. God, how amazing. Well, that was not the answer I expected. No. But, how, but there we are. maybe that is part of what feel, it does feel like. You know, when it starts, you do feel that there is a strong relationship between the two men who are there. Yeah. And you feel a sort of, um, not protective of it, but you don't want the new guy no. to spoil it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, and that, I think, is a sign of a yeah. great play, but I mean, also I think, a great production. Uh, I mean, Frank, but I'm sure, concur with this, that... In any production, I cast very carefully. It might seem I cast eccentrically from this process, but I cast very carefully because I don't just cast people who can play the parts. I have cast people who I know will collaborate. And if you have non-collaborative actors in a rehearsal room, it's deadly. I've been unlucky to have that very, very, very rarely, but I work very hard and I talk to other people about those actors. I check them out, literally get references on them which indeed I did with, with, with my, my three, uh, and they all got glowing references from people they'd, they'd worked with. This play of all plays, you could not walk into a rehearsal room unless each of the three actors left their ego at the door and walked in and opened themselves up. And, you know, we rehearsed, but these three people didn't know each other, never met each other before. So they walked in and said, we're introduced to each other on the first day of rehearsal. We had four weeks rehearsal in London and one here, and five weeks later, they're inseparable and we'd walk into the traffic for each other. And that's important. It's important in the atmosphere and attitude you have in rehearsal, but you can't do it if actors aren't prepared to do that. And, that's really and it's essential. the honouring of the play as Completely. well, that it's, it's layered down. Yeah. Frank, seeing it again, um, does it feel a changed play for you? Yeah. Yeah. It, it does, actually. I mean, I've seen two run-throughs now. And I'm, I'm seeing it tonight for the first time um, with, you know, it, uh, with great excitement, actually. Mm. I was, what age is I? I was 38 when I wrote it. Mm. And um, I'm not 38 anymore. <laughs> I'm older. And I think it'll be quite strange to see it now closer to the age Michael is, the Englishman is, than yeah. the Irishman was, which... He was close but to because of that road. sense, as we all get older, we mm. all have a sense of the shadow behind us. Well, than. yes, and I wonder what's going to be, what I'm going to find most significant about the play now, and what I'm going to find um, most touching about the play, and what I'm going to find most frightening about it. Um, I've always wanted Michael to direct it, um, you know, because... I'm not a stage life where I just want directors who can direct. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's all, just cast it, yeah. get the good designer and put it on. You know, and you put mean, the text to... And you know, toss the, the text. The text and, yeah. and, and Michael will do that to the yeah. end of yeah. the thing with his life. Um, so I, 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 am, I am wondering what's going to happen in it, actually, because even though I know obviously what's going to happen, I'm wondering how it's going to happen. And I feel that... It's been a fair while since I saw it, a fair while actually, and I, you know, I heard it at the read through and I heard it when we did the, um, when we did the run in London actually, and part of me is grief stricken that it is now nearly 25 years since it went on because it's another world. Um, but we did talk, uh, should we modernise it, should we do certain things that would say it's happening now, and we were both adamant we keep it where it was written, we keep it to them, because um, it's not just that the politics have changed, obviously the politics have changed, um, and it's not just because we've changed and the rest of it, it's because I would hope there is an integrity about the men as they were written that I feel is still in fighting form, still in fighting spirit, and I wanted to... Um, I want to acknowledge that something was done at that time by um, you know, these three men in this play that I still stand by yes. entirely. And one of the 
problems about modernising would be that the situation of the world and that part of the world now is so vilely different yes. um, that it that that sense of possibility of escape truthfully would be very hard to even run that through now and I did wonder about whether you feel the audiences see it with different eyes because of all the very dreadful things that are happening oh, I think now. they have to they have to I you know I I, I don't want to um, take away from anybody who hasn't seen it yet but I'm very glad it ends the way it ends and I'm very glad it goes the way it goes because in its way, I don't think it spares itself the, um, the appalling crisis of violence that has happened in the Middle East. In its, its way, it's still, um, without indulging in it, without turning into some kind of pornographic indulgence, it still says this continues. Mm. And I still believe that what happens is happening in the Middle East started it, in those years. Yes, in Beirut. That's and, where yes, it began. Yes, back in, back in the 80s. That's where the real horror began. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I felt also the, the someone who will watch over me, the beauty of listening to the song and the lovely idea and the, the wonderful line from the Quran about mm. the watchers. But of course, modern ears also know about the sort of watchers that there are in those situations yes. now. So there's a one last question from me before we go out to the audience. The design... Um, is exceptional, I thought, right down to the fact that this deeply black carpet makes a proper blackout in the way that they must have had, and you don't normally get in a theatre. Um, was that something that you felt very determined about, that you would try not to replicate a, a cell, obviously, with a dripping, but that that attention to detail, you would give your designer the freedom to do what he does, and I don't want to spoil it because it, no. it's very striking when you, when you see it. Well, it's very hard. To, those of you who've seen it will know what I'm about to not talk about. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the design contains a surprise. And the only thing I'll give away about it is that the basis upon which Rob and I approached it was that we never, ever wanted the audience to see the cell without the men in it. So you can piece together what I've just said so as you as you're sitting here now you're not seeing the cell and um and so it, it was very important and even in the interval uh that we didn't want three chains left on the stage and the actors going off for a cup of coffee we, we wanted that 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 cell not to be available to them um a bit like frank's writing you have to strike the right balance between accuracy and theatricality um, f not unlike the, the, the first play I did of Frank, Sons of Ulster, um, he has a, and I invite those of you who've not seen the play yet, to watch carefully for this, because he does two things that are, amongst many others, that, that are very particular to him. One is he moves absolutely seamlessly from comedy to pathos, and you simply don't notice those, those dividing lines. And they can be within a line, uproarious comedy and then deep pathos and of course what they do is they set each other off so the the comedy becomes like a safety valve for the for the three of them and for us and the other thing it does is that it moves seamlessly between this is a deeply inadequate word for it a kind of poetic diction and a naturalistic diction and again you don't you don't sit there in the audience going ah well, he's gone poetic now. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, thank God. Um, you, 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 you just hear them. But there are areas in the play where the language is pared back to the absolute minimum. And um, this was true of Sons of Ulster as well. That, 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 uh, and, Frank, and it's because you don't notice those joins. It's an extraordinary journey. So, for example, just to give you an example about design... I'm sitting here in the light of the play, and I've worked with this country's, I think, finest lighting designer on this show, a woman called Paulie Constable. And Paulie and I talked about the style of the lighting. And, of course, if you lit the play in a do with documentary accuracy, you lot would want your money back because you wouldn't be able to see them. And um, it would be monotonous and it would be um, depressing. And so we decided to find the right balance between atmosphere and theatricality. 
and that actually, finally, the, 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 the theatricality, that the theatre of what happens is more important. What's important in this play is the relationship between three men, pure and simple. If you can't see their faces, you don't share that relationship. You don't share that story. And so that balance between, you can see what I'm saying, in relation to Frank's writing, was as true for the design. And so the non-naturalism of what I described earlier, of not seeing the cell without the men in it, is a theatrical device. But I think it honours the atmosphere of the play, and the same for the lighting and the same for the sound. For example, at one stage I was thinking of having all kinds of extraneous sounds of men shouting in the street, or calls to prayer, or markets, in the, and I cut all that. Everything. There isn't a single sound in the play. Not one. Um, no sound of the, of the people who have taken them captive. Nothing. Because it's not relevant. What's relevant is this melting pot of the three of them together. And it made that incredibly potent sound effect that is so often underused so potent, namely silence. Silence itself is a sound effect. People having to live with silence. And, uh, 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 and, and that, but that's a theatrical concept. Of course, in reality... Um, you would hear sounds from the outside, but it's not a documentary. But it it's is very, it's very, very powerful when you're in the theatre. Um, can we have the house lights up a bit, please? We have time for a, a, a few questions. Um, just put your hand up, and I, yes, and Greg there, and then Lady there. Yep. I wanted to ask you, um, in connection with uh, Frank's excellent script and his writing, how much scope there was for you as a director to actually apply your own stuff to uh, what was really written in the script. I mean, how much how much does the script direct you as a director to direct the actors to work in a fixed kind of way? Well, Frank writes with very, very few stage directions. Um, there are some writers who are irritatingly full of stage directions, like, you know, in brackets when an actor starts to speak steadfastly or angrily or with irritation. Adverbs and, are the enemy. Uh, you know, yes. and, and, and that's deeply irritating and quite insulting to the actors. Um, so he's very spare, very, very spare. And when he says something, he means it. Um, there is, and I'm not, those of you who've seen the play, those of you who ha- will know what I'm talking about, those of you who haven't, you will see one of the most astonishing stage directions I've ever come across in a play. In fact, I think it is the most astonishing. And it's an action that the two men do at the end of the play, which makes me cry every evening. And that is an act of creative imagination of Frank's, um, which says the equivalent of four pages of dialogue. It's absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. And so my observation was always about the text. I mean, if if you're doing The Winter's Tale, you know, you're doing a play that's been done 101 times before, you have to walk in on day one, like it or not, with the actors, with the world. This is the world of my production. I don't believe that's what your job is um, with a play like this. My job is to know that play backwards, that I could quote from it on day one, but not come in with what I want to put onto it. What I want to put onto it would be a presumption. And if at the end of five or six or seven weeks work on it, I've realised the play. That's my job. It's, I don't believe that plays speak for themselves. I'm not saying that. I think you have to conjure the music from them. But you have to conjure the music from them rather than imposing your own music. Thank you. Lady there. Thank you. The question, um, the, the question was who the original cast had been 25 years ago when it was first done, Frank. Uh, Stephen Ray played the Irishman, played Herbert. Um, and I had known Stephen... Um, from we were young fellows, and we'd never worked before till then. My beloved friend, Alec McCowan, played the Englishman, um, and uh, I got to know him very well. He had just done um, Dance and Clunas, Brian Free was a great play, so he, had, he was in his Irish phase, as he called it. <laughs> and then uh, Hugh Quarshie played it um, in, played the American, he played Adam. Uh, that he didn't uh, do it in the West End or in um, New York. We had to get an American actor in, and James McDaniel took over then. Um, and it was... Um, it, there were three radically different um, men, um, and Robin Lefevre directed it, 
And um, a Scot. Scots guy. <laughs> really, really made things interesting. And um, uh, that was it, actually. We went, we went from there. Yeah. Okay. So, another question. Lady in the front and then lady up there, and then we'll have to stop. Yep. And so would you have liked to have done it without an interval? I saw it without an interval. Yeah. Um, and I, I genuinely was. I went to San Diego to see it without an interval. Uh, because that was the first time it was ever done, because it was done in the round. And I felt, um, I felt that they, they worked extraordinarily hard to uh, pull it off without an interval. But there was, a, there was, I thought, a diminishing of the sense of captivity when, you know, the, when what happens, happens in the play. Um, Michael and I did talk about doing it without an interval. And um, I love working with our director, our designer, Robert Jones, whom I've worked with a lot. Um, and I always know that, um, I always call Robert is called like a, a Lady Bracknell of design because they come upon you as a surprise, pleasant or otherwise, as yeah. the case may be. Uh, it's always been pleasant. And this time, I was jumping for joy on the first day of rehearsal because, of course, Rob takes a play and reads it and knows it. And he's come up with a perfect solution for how an interval really can be staged as a part of the play. I'm relieved that the interval is there because I feel there is a natural break in the play. I do genuinely know. It's taken me 25 years to know that, <laughs> but now I do know there is a natural break in the play, and I don't think I would let it go on now without an interval. Yeah. And also, it reminds us that we're free to go, actually. Exactly. I thought that was quite no, powerful. No. Lady there for a final question. Have any of the three original hostages ever seen the play? Did you ever have a reaction? Yes, Brian has seen it a couple of times. And uh, John saw it. Um, and I think Terry Waite saw it as well, but I'm not mm. sure. I, yeah, I met Brian, obviously, after he saw it. Um, and I saw John after he saw it as well. Uh, no, I didn't see John. He, Brian brought him, and they saw it together. Mm. And I, he, Brian just sent me a message saying everything was OK. I, I tend to um, leave them alone. You know, when writing it, I didn't go near them and finishing it, I tried to have a minimum amount of hassle for them. So I leave them alone. You should, uh, if you have a moment, I think it's being sold here, actually. You should buy the published text, not, not the collected. I don't know if it's in the collected McGuinness, but certainly the individual text. There's an article written by Brian Keenan about the play. I, uh, I, I recommend it to you all. Thank you. And those of you, I'm sure, who have... Uh, not seen it or about to see it, but the programme is, is terrific as well. I think there are some really wonderful articles in there about how it all came about. Um, I'm really devastated. We've got to stop. Uh, you very generously said we could go on a tiny bit longer, um, and we have done, but as always, in time on a tradition, we must give the Playhouse back to the players um, in good time. For now, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Attenborough and Frank Evil McGuinness. Thank you.